Next up, we got two very smart, smart individuals. Maxim and Sergey, CEO and Chief Research Officer of Neuromation. They're going to be talking about computation for AI, problems, solutions, and trends. I'm, I'm stepping away, you guys. <laughs> Hello. 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 Hello, my name is Maxim Prasilov. I'm founder and CEO of uh, Neuromation. And uh, uh, we're talking about uh, two different novels, what is bring, brings to you today. Uh, for starter, one year ago, um, for starter, one year ago, our small startup uh, have experience to in object uh, detection on shelf availability for retail. Thousand objects uh, we need to uh, to recognize on the shelf, and it was and it was uh, a problem uh, for our small startups. Uh, there are two main problems of uh, every AI startup in the world. So, not enough labeled data. So, I'm not first We're talking about data today. As you know, this sentence, data is new oil. So, we have not enough labeled data to train algorithm, to uh, make deep learning applications. And other, it's expensive computing power. Everybody who uh, uh, pay to, for AWS or uh, Microsoft or uh, Google, you know, that's it's huge uh, expense for uh, every uh, AI research, for every uh, AI startup. So, and, uh, and we are not uh, uh, alone uh, in the universe. In the bottleneck, the bottleneck of uh, automation of every industry, it's not enough labeled data to train a neural network. And to create the data, for example, for different computer vision uh, algorithm, it's very hard human work. So it's thousand hours to label data to make a bounding box around object on the real photos. So, uh, for example, if we need to automate retail, uh, it's about uh, 170,000 SKU items on the shelves in supermarket. You need at least uh, one billion photos labeled examples to do that, to train your algorithm. So if we count in it uh, according to the price of uh, uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk or any other labeling, uh, data labeling services, it's about uh, 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 over uh, $200 uh, million. So, and it's 11,000 uh, uh, years of human work. So it's absolutely impossible to do that in a short period. And we found the way. We create system of uh, synthetic data. So, to do that, to make a synthetic photo, we create 3D objects, put it into a uh, uh, 3D generator, and generate millions of examples, which is perfect labeled, 100% every pixel, and it's absolutely automation process, and it's very, very fast. So, and we have no limits with the data for training our algorithm. And we have only one problem, how to get computing power to do that, because it requires huge computing power first to render data and then to train in neural network. So, and this is also a bottleneck for uh, all uh, AI practitioners. So, if we, we use our method, and use, for example, cloud servers like AWS or, uh, or Google, we are, we are not cost effective. And we also found the way. So, one year ago, when I uh, tried to uh, build our own cluster based on GPU in video, video cards, it was absolutely impossible to buy it. Because all this capacity grabbed by cryptocurrency miners from the market. And in May last year, so we cannot buy even 10 video cards because it was <laughs> absolutely uh, impossible by that reason. And when we found that uh, uh, this the process is going on, we need our capacity to train. We have no money uh, uh, to pay uh, these big cloud services, but we have a task. We come to the miners and we find out very interesting things. That the cryptocurrency miners get nothing comparing big cloud services get from a scientist to train algorithm. 
For example, for six GPU mining farm, cryptocurrency mining, uh, get about 10 to 12 dollars a day. At the same time, for this capacity, we pay to cloud service about six to eight dollars per hour. After that, we come to the miners and said, miners, do you want to get 15 a day? And we will pay you in Ether, in cryptocurrency. And they said, okay, how many cards you need? And we take about 1,000 GPU to our cluster immediately. And we begin to train to uh, make an, uh, training on distributed computing power and produce synthetic data on that. So it's 10 times cheaper for us than any cloud service in the world. And we find that we can spread this idea for uh, everybody, for every AI, AI practitioners. Because we have uh, two bottlenecks, solution for two bottlenecks, data and computing power at the same time. And we call this process knowledge mining. But on another problem we have, how we can negotiate and make an, um, business with a different computational uh, nodes, with a different uh, subject in 100 user diction. So, yes. we create an animation platform with the three main component of uh, uh, AI solution. It's synthetic data sets generator, uh, distributed computing power, and machine learning models. And uh, this is marketplace, what we create uh, based on distributed computing, uh, powered on by our own uh, Naira token. So we create Naira token to pay as a form to pay miners in blockchain for their distributed computing power. But we pay not about blockchain or, or making uh, cryptocurrency. We pay them for useful computing because we believe that revenue based economy, it's only the answer what we can use this perfect computing power for something useful. And after that, so uh, we create everything for everybody who has, for example, uh, their own GPU or for AI practitioners and united in one platform. Of course, synthetic data is not uh, acceptable uh, to uh, any form of uh, uh, research. And our chief research officer, Sergei Nikolinka, now explains some very potential interesting use cases, what we have now. Sergei? Uh, thank you, Max. So, um, yeah, the clicker still doesn't work. So, uh, I am here to basically present a couple of interesting use cases for the synthetic data and for the deep, for deep learning that we do. And I am personally in charge of, a, of the deep learning part of Neuromation. Next slide, please. <laughs> um, so I probably can skip this slide here, right? So you probably all know about the deep learning revolution and how it has changed the way we see machine learning over the, the last 10 years. But uh, the two specific examples that I want to touch upon are first the retail project that Max has already told you a little bit about. So let me go into slightly more detail and show you how synthetic data works in this case. Um, so as Max said, uh, when you want to recognize the objects on supermarket shelves, you have two main issues, two main problems that differentiate this from pre-existing research from standard classical computer vision models. One problem is, and this is a research problem that we are all working on right now, uh, one problem is the huge number of classes, right? The huge number of different objects that you have to recognize. And there are 170,000 different objects only in the Russian-speaking database, right? Because we, we were working with Russian retail, but uh, uh, in, in the English-speaking world, I, I imagine there would be even more. And uh, so this is the first problem. This is a research problem that we are working on. And the second problem is that, of course, there is no data, okay? So we have been collaborating with the retailers for the last half, half year, and so far, we have hardly been able to extract at least a validation set just to test how well our models do, right? So 
uh, there basically there are no there is no data and there is no way to get it so and on the other hand to recognize this many classes we need a lot of data so we need a lot of labeled photos so what do we do uh, we create a virtual copy of the shelf we create a 3d model of the shelf right and we create 3d models of the objects and here you can see that um, the retail project is perfectly suited for synth for synthetic data because you know it would be it would be hard to do it with a human face for example but a bottle of water is pre is a pretty simple 3d model and moreover you can take a single bottle and you can put different labels on it so the diff it will be different objects for recognition but it's the same 3d model right so and once you do that so this is manual work yes but once you do that you can create a completely uh, completely endless stream of perfectly labeled data next slide you can uh, you can create 100 percent accurate labelings you can create labelings that are pixel perfect like for example we have to do segmentation so we have to you know get the silhouettes of objects that are you know, on the pictures and uh, a, a human cannot really or at least it would take years for a human to actually you know pinpoint what specific pixels belong to which object here you get it for free right if it's a scene you render yourself you, you know everything moreover you actually have data you have information that is impossible to get by hand for example distance to the camera right or like the depth right the, the third coordinate or for example the rotation angle of the objects like which side is the the bottle facing and again you can maybe approximate it by hand but in a, in a in a 3d renderer you can have it you can have the exact angle that 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 the that the bottle is rotated and of course it is much cheaper than to label photos one by one by hand and let me just show a couple of examples so this is these are some of the packets of juice that we that we make this is how they look like without the textures with the textures next slide and here they are on the shelf right so this is an actual uh, synthetic image and whenever we show it to the retailers they always assume it's a real photo it's not and when they realize it's not a real photo they are always asking how can we get these photos for our catalogs <laughs> because they are actually better quality than you can do in, in real in the real world next slide and it, so this was the first example and the second example is completely different uh, and also a very exciting and interesting project that we do it's also in computer vision but the pro yeah you have a question Oh, of course. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, uh, so basically, yeah. If we had an equivalent amount of real data, it would be better, of course. But there is no equivalent amount of real data, and it would be impossibly expensive to to, to produce. Um, okay. So the second question, the, the second project is I call it Piglet's Big Brother because it's about pigs and it's about pig farming, and it's a very nice story. I, I like to tell it. So let me tell tell it to you. Um, in pig farming, the most important part is feeding. Okay, so basically, food for for the pigs is like 70, 75 percent of the cost of of the pork. So maybe, maybe that's not the best city. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's not the best city to speak about this. Sorry, guys. <laughs> anyway, uh, so so this is of paramount importance. Okay, F feeding is feeding is the most important thing, and. Pig farmers want to optimize feeding, okay? Uh, I'll replace it with cows. Ca cow farmers want to optimize feeding. Uh, but uh, the thing is, okay, we, 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 we do not know how to optimize feeding, right? You need, to, you need to know something about the pig farming to do it. But uh, to optimize it, you need data, right? So to optimize the, the food, they need to know how well the pig is doing, right? So they need to have accurate measurements of the weight of the pigs along their lives, right? But on the other hand, currently, even on the most modern and the best pig farms in the world, they only weigh pigs twice in their lives. For the first time when they come in, like little piglets, and for the second time when they go to their final destination. So, uh, so why? What is, what is the problem? And this, this, is, this is a very interesting, there is a very interesting answer to this question. Next slide. The answer is, if you, th it is no problem to put the pig on the scale, right? It's no problem to get the pig, put it on the scale, put it back. But it's a huge stress for the pig. 
And when the pig gets stressed, it stops eating and it loses weight. So yes, you can get the data, but then it would be kind of meaningless. So th the data would not match the actual feeding, and basically you, you would the, the profits from better feeding would be lost. So our project, next slide, our project is to feed the uh, to, to weigh the pigs in a non-invasive way, right? So we we install cameras in the pig dens, I guess it's called in English, in the pig dens, and uh, we try to estimate from these cameras, from by computer vision algorithms, we try to estimate the size, the linear sizes of, of the pigs, and this is actually even even better for the farmers than direct to the weight. Um, and again, this is a problem where it looks like a standard computer vision problem, and it it basically it is, but there is no data, and it would be very hard to collect, uh, you know, uh, to, to collect the data because then you can get the video feeds of real pigs, but then you would have to measure each of them, right? So you would have to actually know the target variable, the, the sizes, and this is hard. So this this would take a lot of work to to, to produce a manually labeled data set here. So we will do we we attack this problem with synthetic data as well. Next slide, and we are getting pretty good results as you can see. And um, there is even the next step, which is video analysis. And video analysis is also important because you know you can't tell that a pig is sick by looking at it. You have to track the behavior. Like it's it's sadly sitting in the corner, then it's probably sick. But uh, anyway, so this is another completely different project where we also use synthetic data for the greater good of deep learning. And of course, it's not limited to pigs. You can you can substitute cows, chickens, whatever. Uh, next slide. And these were the two examples that I wanted to tell you. Here is our team, Max, me, Fyodor, Denise, Konstantin, and many others. Um, and with that, I thank you for your attention, and we both stand open for questions. Thank you. <laughs> questions? Okay, uh, a very good question. I will repeat it. Um, what what are the domains where we can use synthetic data and where we cannot use synthetic data? So the question was specifically about language and natural language processing. So here, at least to my to the best of my knowledge, the answer is negative. We, we cannot use synthetic synthetically generated text because if we were able to synthetically generate text, the problem would be solved already. And in some of the domains, it's like this, right? So in some of the domains. If you can generate something synthetically, it means that you know the whole data distribution. You don't really, I mean, you know everything and y all of your problems are, al are already in the past. But that's not true for computer vision and that's not true for many other industries. And here is where we apply synthetic data. Thank you. Thank you. Come over with questions afterwards off, off, uh, offline. Thank